Thank you all for coming today. Today is another one of our series, What Matters to Me. And it's really about a time where we get to come together and share our passion, share what really matters. And today we have two presenters, Britt and Annie. And we'll talk about that in a second. Is this how many of you your first time here? Anybody? Okay, so so what brought you here today? I'll point to you, Dennis. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, no pressure. I'm interested in hearing what they say. Okay. All right. Some other reason. Your first time? That is the only reason. Okay. I'm interested in You're in for a real treat. So let me tell you about uh, Brittany. And uh, she's going to speak first, followed by Annie. And Annie's going to be first. Okay. We're going to do it that way. Yep. Um, and in between, uh, there's going to be an awkward pause. I'm supposed to be, there's going to be an awkward pause while we change microphones. Um, and so, anyway, we'll start from there. So, Annie is um, from our facilities team. And she's going to be talking about an elephant in the room addressing stigma surrounding addiction. So Annie works with in the, where does she work? Facilities. facilities. <laughs> and in which part? Not just facilities, but in the ground. Ground. OK, very good. Um, and she helps to keep our campus what? Beautiful. She's been working full time at Front Range for two years. Uh, she worked as a seasonal worker, and then she um, and she recently graduated with an associate degree in applied science and horticulture. She's also working on her bachelor's in project management, project management uh, which is really cool. She's from Arvada, and she takes advantage of living close to the mountains through activities such as hiking and snowboarding. So she'll speak first. Um, she's also been really instrumental in with our health care career center building, so she served on our some of our committees to help select the firms, and she's awesome, and she plants tulips outside my office, which makes me happy. <laughs> okay. um, the second speaker will be Brittany, and she's a co-coordinator for Disability Support Services, and she's going to be talking about my journey home, disability, identi identity development. Grew up in Linwood, Washington, um, enjoying crabbing, fishing, and hiking in the evergreen forest with her parents and younger brothers. She graduated from Western Washington University in 2007 with a bachelor's in political science, economics, and philosophy. Oh, I think I did that. Okay, that's really cool. <laughs> um, and she, where she uh, co-founded the Students for Disability Awareness. Afterwards, she spent a year as an AmeriCorps Retention Project Coordinator for helping admit new, new and diverse students a hands program, in which she managed a team of 50 volunteer college students who coached 75 low-income first-generation and migrant high school students through applying through college and choosing their academic path. You know what she does here, amazing, um, and she's going to be getting an award next Thursday. Can I share that, Brittany? Yes, I can. <laughs> <laughs> so the Human Relations Commission, which is part of the Fort Collins City Council, will be recognizing her as one of the recipients of the Human Relations Commission's award, and she's the adult recipient. So we'll start with Annie. All right. Hello. 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 Forward. Okay, so as she just said, Jean just said, I'm Annie and I'm employed at Front Range Community College to take care of the campus grounds. Um, so if you knew me even for a week, you'd be quick to assume that I would be here talking about free range something this or localized something that. In fact, my supervisor calls me Annie Organics. <laughs> um, but I like it. I like it. These things are important to me and I'm passionate about them. So when Andrea Simons, the fantastic woman who puts these on, I don't see you, <laughs> puts, these, puts these series on, came up and asked me what I want to talk about and said, what matters to me? My second nature, easy, repeated over and over again answer is to localize the food system. But life has its tendencies to change on you, throw you through hoops to see how you'll land. And in that moment, in this moment, my experiences have brought me to something else that matters to me. Something that in this moment matters more to me. I'm not going to, but if I did, ask you guys to raise your hand if you know someone who has an addiction. 
many of us would raise a hand. We are not three or even two times removed from addiction. And as we will see, we are all connected one way or another. I'm here today to talk about an elephant in the room to address the stigmas that surround addiction. I'm here to tell you why it matters to me, why it should matter to you, and what resources we have available for those suffering from an addiction and for those supporting an addict as well. So, why it matters to me. To begin, I think it's important for me to show a little humility and courage in myself because if I stigmatize myself in my life, how am I supposed to expect others to overcome but or remove the stigmas placed onto themselves or onto their peers? That would be hypocritical. So instead of my whole fair trade local farmer, vegetables are delicious, <laughs> spiel, I'm going to stand here and for a moment talk about how I have struggled and to hopefully help those struggling today. I want to start by pointing out that a fact, pointing out a fact that a point in my life I was heavily using illicit drugs. That I have lost friends to addiction. That my life at home have been turned upside down because of addiction that my soul has been put to the test. And I'm saying all this out loud because I know that I am not alone. And now you know, you are absolutely not alone. And that you do matter. And that the people surrounding you care about you and your health and your future. And while I struggled with whether or not I should speak up about being honest about what's going on with me, because of the stigmas and the stereotypes placed on people with addictions, I found that most people I tell my story to begin to open up about their own struggles and their own connections to addiction. So even though most people would not have guessed that this would be my topic today, Quick shout out to farmers markets. <laughs> Most people also would not assume that I've had to look around at my friends, my loved one, and at a point in time myself, seemingly slip from my fingertips. I've decided I'm not gonna sit back and pretend that this is not a part of my story. story. I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna sit down and let an incorrect stigma keep me from opening up the conversation to allow a path for those struggling to receive help. Life is hard. Addiction is hard. Supporting an addict is hard. And if talking about this struggle helps someone to come forward to receive the help that is needed, I will continue to be open about my story. As a community, we should be willing to help each other. And we can't do this. We can't help our students, our coworkers, friends, and family. If we place stigmas on each other, ignoring the facts, and in turn, avoid talking about it. So why should we be paying attention? Why should it matter to you? According to the National Institute on Drug Abuse, last year, 2017, 72,000 people died from a drug overdose. And according to the National Institute, and that's in the United States, um, and according to the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, an estimated 88,000 people die annually from alcohol-related causes. Between 2015 and 2016, data from 31 states in Washington, D.C., reported by Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, showed that overall drug overdose death rates increased by 21.5%. And while, of course, the life of a person is the number one reason to be paying attention, substance abuse and addiction inflict our society and economy through multitude of ways. For example, 
Substance abuse impacts health and the cost of health care. This includes costly visits because of overdoses, mental health needs, transmitted infectious diseases, and other illnesses related to, to drug use. It includes mortality costs, drug prevention and treatment center and prevention costs. These costs continue to include impacts on safety, such as drug affected and drunk driving accidents. The impacts on environment through the manufacture and disposal of drugs, these get introduced into our water systems and inadvertently into our vegetation, wildlife, and humans. The economic effects continue to include crime productivity and governance. In fact, stated by the National Institute on Drug Abuse, more than $740 billion annually in costs related to crime, lost work productivity, and health are associated to substance abuse. These are great examples of why we cannot put our heads in the sand and ignore the impact of addiction on society, our economy, and the life of an individual. To remind you, an individual with a potential. An individual who, if new, was not alone and felt as though was a part of a community is that much more likely to succeed. If we want to make changes, we must be willing to listen to each other. And most importantly, to listen without judgment. Because addiction can happen to anyone. Speaking of judgment, next I want to talk about the stigmas that surround addiction. To address the stigmas that surround addiction, we must first understand what a stigma is. A stigma is defined by Merriam-Webster as a mark of shame or discredit. When society stigmatizes addiction, we are ultimately staining a human's credibility for something that person cannot control. In addition, to, under to address the stigmas that surround addiction, we must understand what addiction is. That substance abuse physically alters the way the brain works. Defined by the American Society of Addiction Medicine, addiction is a primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry. It is stigmatized that addiction is a moral failure, a choice, a lack of values. If this were true, why do addicts try and try again to stop? They cannot. An addict is willing to give up their health and their freedom, work and housing, friends and family. It is not a question of morals or values. Addiction changes the function and biochemistry of the brain. Neuroscientist Nora Volkow, director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, explains it well in a 2018 TED Med series. She explains, People who have an addiction have a reduction of dopamine D2 receptors. Dopamine in the brain rewards us for behavior. It helps ensure the survival of an individual or a species. Without it, the brain loses function to decide what is necessary for immediate or extended survival. If in fact we want or expect an addict to demonstrate self-control, how is this individual supposed to do so without a properly functioning brain. The stigma of addiction being a lack of self-control or a moral failure is wrong, and its inaccuracy is dangerous for the addict and for those supporting an addict. If we educate ourselves and our communities about what addiction is, to not make this an excuse, but rather a reason to help, we can change our perception and in turn begin the process necessary to create fact-based fundamental resources that have the proper tools, oversight, standards, and regulations to help those in need. This brings me to my final subject matter. FRCC provides 
um, I'm sorry, <laughs> I would like to talk about some of the resources specifically for Front Range Community College students and employees. FRCC provides six free confidential student, uh, confidential counseling sessions for students per semester on the campus with a licensed counselor. And this counselor can refer students if necessary for more in-depth help. If you are a student and you would like more information, I have materials in the back um, and you can also go to the Advising Center in Mount Ontario for more information or to set up an appointment. If you are an employee of Front Range Community College, you have a resource called CSAP. And this resource provides free counseling services as well as additional resources. You can go to www.colorado.gov slash CSAP for more information. Um, of course, our human resources on campus is always here and happy to help as well. Materials are in the back for this too. Um, resources continue to include anonymous programs, peer support groups, in and out patient programs, treatment facilities, sober living facilities, and more. To conclude, no addict has ever aspired to be an addict. And we shall not define addicts with a stain of a stigma. We shall provide a hand, educate ourselves and others, and most importantly, provide a path in a community that allows an addict to live successfully in recovery. Thank you. So we're going to do a quick change, microphones, you can get some more snacks in the back, talk to your neighbor, talk to Annie, ask her about free range, anything. And she's the chair of the Colorado Wyoming Association on Higher Education and Disability and the coordinator for the Unlearning Race and Reads Book Club through Fort Collins. And she knits, and she does knit with Brits. Do you like that? <laughs> so, all right, she promised to come back and we're going to have the knitting. Yeah. All right, so anyway, Britt, Wonderful, thank you. So first I apologize if I talk really quickly. When I get excited, I get talkative, and I talk quickly, and, so, and with my hands, and I walk around, so I'm gonna try this. <laughs> we'll see what happens. All right, so I'm gonna talk to you about my journey through disability identity development. Um, a lot of you probably already know I have a disability. I actually have three of them. I'm going to talk about one today. Um, I'm going to talk about my journey from shame to pride, from being sick to being an activist, and from being estranged from my body to coming home. Hence the title. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's good, huh? This is me. Yeah, I was four years old. I think you'd say I still have the same curiosity and the enthusiasm uh, today as I did then, right? I think. Um, <laughs> this was after my first femoral surgery um, to correct my gait. That is how I walked, right? Um, you see, when I was born, two months premature and two pounds and 14 ounces, Blue in the face because my lungs couldn't support my tiny little body. I was born with a condition known as cerebral palsy, which I will refer to as CP because I get tongue tied. My legs were underdeveloped and came into the world a little bent inward, which for me made running, walking, sitting different and sometimes difficult for me. But I still had some fun. Yeah. So when I was four years old, I went to Children's Hospital in Portland, Oregon, and underwent what is known as femoral rotational osteotomies. Okay, is anyone queasy in here? <laughs> A little bit? Okay. Um, basically, what happened is they cut my femurs in half, rotated them outward, and reattached them. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I had a series of three casts and a recovery period of about nine months where I couldn't leave my wheelchair. I spent the next 18 years of my life in physical therapy to learn how to walk and run and get to know my new body. 
Do you still remember that first friend you ever met? <laughs> yes. Um, I do. I don't remember her name, but I still remember meeting her like it was yesterday. I was getting a tour of the hospital before my surgery, and the nurse was telling me how much I would love it here. All the chocolate pudding, all of the TV, how much I could just lay in bed for hours and do whatever I wanted. And then we entered my room, and there was this little girl um, who was an amputee below the, the knee, the, both knees, and she was jumping up on her bed, super excited, shouting at the top of her lungs, my legs are coming, my legs are coming. She was so excited when she saw me, her eyes widened like a fox seeing prey. What do you think I thought? As soon as I went, um, as I, I thought to myself, as soon as I went under, they were going to cut my legs off and they were going to give them to her. I was four. I was four years old, okay? I was terrified. I was terrified for her, all right? And I didn't sleep for days. I ignored her. I hid under my covers, and I said, Mommy, please don't let them take my legs. All right, until one day, one day I heard her crying. I mean, uncontrollably sobbing, right? And I realized that something can be really scary until it cries, and it's so vulnerable. Even monsters, right? So I asked her across the room under my covers, what's wrong with you? And she told me that her parents from Russia weren't able to come and see her beautiful new plastic legs. And then I was like, they're plastic? <laughs> my legs aren't plastic. She was talking about prosthetic legs, Duh, right? I had no idea. So immediately being four years old, because we have the mental spasticity of you know rubber band, I was like, cool. And I ran over to her, and I grabbed my sock puppet, and I cheered her up. And we were friends. I tell you that story because I like to remind people how big and diverse the disability population is. She and I had such different disabilities, yet we could connect on some really common fears and hopes. Right? The fear of being alone and the hope that we would be cured. I also want to say that my story is mine alone, and I will only speak from my experience today, um, since that's all that I can speak from and some research that I've done. Um, I don't claim to know everything there is to know about disability, and I'm honestly always learning because this population is so big. So as we have time for questions later, I would love to hear your stories. I would love to continue the conversation, and I would love to keep this open because that's what this is about. If you don't take anything else away, take that. Deal? Okay. So ever since being that little girl and meeting other people with various disabilities and medical conditions, I have wondered so many things. Why are people with such vastly different conditions from deafness to amputated limbs to CP to traumatic brain injuries lumped into this one category, disability? Why do some people proclaim disability as a sense of self and part of them, and others seek to avoid the label at all costs? And today, I'm going to talk about a few different lenses of disability to give us some clue or some idea of what that might be, some of these commonalities that do exist across this label disability. You can insert medical condition, you can insert challenge or learning difference in there, whatever you would like to use. Thanks to the researcher Rosalind Darling, who explored three orientations of disability, we're going to look at the societal framework, the personal identity, and the situational roles of what it could look like depending on a person's unique experience of what's common among people with disabilities. The first one is the societal framework. This comes up quite often. We look at this um, continuum between the medical and social world. Why does society see a group of traits like muscle spasticity, which is what I have, challenges with reading, and vision loss as similar? Well, to understand that, we must look at the medical community. 
most of the definitions of disability, even in le legal terms, which identify it as a mental or physical impairment, establish that uh, there is a normal way of functioning and that people with disabilities live outside of these norms and operate outside of this functioning. We have words like abnormal psychology or unhealthy to describe this. And the medical community creates treatments and medications to fix or cure the diseased person and bring them closer to what is considered normal. The person with the condition is sick, uh, is the one with the illness, and therefore it's their responsibility to get better and to overcome obstacles and to overcome barriers to meet all the same demands as society. And we often are amazed as people without that specific disability when they do that, and often entertained in media and in our culture when that occurs. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, the social model of disability, most prominent in the UK, poses that disability is not caused by inherent defects of that person, but rather the way society is organized. Disability is therefore a social construct, and it is when society removes barriers on behalf of people with the disability that they can be fully independent and achieve equal status in society. So, I don't know about you, but I see this happen all the time. I see bus stops covered in snow. I see, uh, not on this campus, <laughs> um, but I see parking spaces covered in snow, and especially um, accessible ones. And uh, a medical-minded person might say, hey, shovel your own parking spot. A social-minded person might say, why hasn't someone shoveled the spot? Right? That's our responsibility. Right? In many ways, what unites people with disabilities is this push and pull along the spectrum between this medical and social framework. It's not either or, it's both and all the time. Okay. Then we look at the identity development of the person within the societal framework, right? Another common experience is shame and pride. The shame identity relates to the idea that if we prescribe the medical framework and believe there is something inherently wrong with us, this creates cognitive dissonance between the good things we believe about ourselves and the bad parts of ourselves, including how our disability might limit, challenge, or make something not possible for us. On the other end of the spectrum is a sense of pride in our identity as a person with a disability. Replacing shame, pride is felt when we have the ability to enjoy our bodies and experiences, inclusive of having a disability, and it's coexistent and salient for us, and we share it with the world. Another story time. I still remember the most shame I ever felt. It was the first time since I was four and had that surgery. I was uh, in college, I had my second surgery, same one, but I was 17 going into freshman year of college. And I was on my way back to my dorm and it was the most blizzardy, cold, wet winter we ever had in Washington. I know we're in Colorado, but in Washington. And I was stuck at the top of a hill that had a 16% grade and black ice in a manual wheelchair. And I knew that if I tried going down the hill myself, I was probably going to die. <laughs> yeah. And um, so I did what any reasonable person would do. Nothing. I just sat there for two hours in the snow and wet and cold as the sun was going down and did not do anything. Didn't ask for help, didn't accept the nice help that people had, the strangers had coming by asking, do you need any help? Can I help you down? No, I'm good. And I realized about an hour later, I probably need help. I'm probably gonna die of pneumonia at this point. And I made a negotiation with myself, I bet you all do this sometimes, right? That, okay, the next person that asks me, I'll say yes, right? So I did, I did. And that person now is one of my greatest friends Colin Watron, and he actually works at Western Washington University as admissions counselor. And uh, um, I'll tell you that story later. But, um, <laughs> and uh, I told myself that I'm no longer going to be that person on top of that hill. 
I am no longer going to be living in that shame um, because that wasn't useful to me, right? What use did that have to me? So instead of adopting that uh, sick role that I was perceiving of myself of being, of being helpless, of having that role of there's nothing I can do, I took on an advocate role. And the next day, you want to bet, I marched into disability services because I didn't yet have accommodations because I didn't need it. <laughs> and I said, is there anything that we could do so that I don't have to be on that hill anymore? And they moved all my classes to the bottom of the hill. How social model of them, right? <laughs> That's pretty cool. Pretty cool. So looking at that, I like to think about um, where was that turning point for me, right? What does this mean for working with students? Because uh, college was the turning point for me. Um, this is a picture of the Disability Outreach Center, which I co-founded when I was a college student at Western Washington University. When I first got to Western Washington University, um, I was discovered, right? People already knew I was in a wheelchair, but I had um, five other people in my dorm who also had cerebral palsy. And for the first time, it was obvious to everyone else in the world that I had a disability since I was four, right? So now I couldn't hide, I couldn't live in shame, I couldn't live in fear, I, I actually had to show everybody I am disabled, I have a disability. So I had to choose, I had to choose either to associate with those people or, or to not do that or to welcome that and embrace that and be part of that community, right? And I still remember that friend that I made that first day who said, hey, you have cerebral palsy, right? And I was like, oh my gosh, he knows. How do you know? <laughs> and he was like, I just, I just see, I just, I have it too. Like, it's not a big deal. And that thought crossed my mind. And then the second question he asked me, hey, I noticed I didn't have a disability awareness club on campus. You want to start one? I must have said yes, because then I became the vice president. <laughs> and so how does the person who's the very most shamed of who they are become the person who is convincing other people with disabilities to attend your college because you're going to do great things? Because this is a place that is accessible and accepting to you? How does that happen? Right? And so part of that is through some um, looking at identity development theory like this, right? Looking at as nonlinear, looking at as not stuck and not good or bad. This side is not bad. That side is not good. This is just how we flow, right? So the fact that when I was on that hill, I was in the medical shame sick role is not bad. That's just where I was. But what I know is that it wasn't useful to me because I think I, I still think I probably would have died um, in that one particular situation. But there are situations where that serves me, where I probably need medical attention. I probably need help, right? And there's times where I really need to be an advocate for myself and I really need to make sure I'm taking pride in what I'm doing for myself, right? And so what are some things we can take away? I have done, um, and I know, I'm I know I'm going over time. <laughs> I've done quite a bit of um, informal, non-IRB approved research. <laughs> um, it, uh, interviewing some students and researching some students at CSU and actually across the nation asking them about how they identify with disability and what matters to them. Some say that it's part of their identity and some don't. And the gist of it is, it matters if they've been given the opportunity that I did, which was to be involved, which was to take on a role, which was to be an advocate for themselves, to be a leader on their campus, to be someone that could go out and achieve something separate from, but I have a disability. A lot of students that I interviewed, when they said it's not part of my identity, the reason was it doesn't define me, I'm not limited by it. They're still in that sick role. They're still ashamed of it. But when they look at, when I looked in, and I actually did um, more work with 
taking, surveying students um, who were involved in high impact practices, mentorship programs, study abroad, employment, and I asked them, um, and, I, and I also looked at students who weren't, and I asked them, tell me about your disability, tell me about how you see yourself, tell me about your sense of belonging on campus, tell me about who you find community with. The students who had involvement on campus and who, of course, right, were connected with other people on campus, we already know that. They already have a greater sense of belonging. But in addition to that, felt a greater sense of self-concept and sense of self when it related to their disability, right? So when we look at that, disability should really be seen as a measure of inclusion on campus. It really should be seen as what can we do to engage our students with disabilities in anything that we have to offer on campus. And also, what other intersecting identities do these students have that we should also be paying attention to? Because I could go on for another hour on other identity development theories and other ways that students show up in combination in relation to their disability identity, right? And so when we think about it, there's um, so much we can learn both from our students and that they can learn being here on campus. And um, I just get so excited when I think about um, one of the, uh, just in, in closing, one of the things that I heard, which was probably one of the most um, sad things when I was at Western Washington was a professor, a faculty member, who said on an admissions committee, are we sure that we want students with disabilities on campus? Aren't they more expensive? Aren't they, don't they take more work? Aren't they, don't they need more advising? I mean, you, all, the, all the assumptions you could think about, he named them all, right? And what I actually found out uh, for this person was students with disabilities are more likely to be involved on campus, <coughs> to create lasting impact on campus, and also to donate afterwards because this is the place that they feel home. So if you have any um, questions for me or I want to talk more, please feel free to do so. And I'm happy to share any more about my personal journey. Sorry for going over time. <laughs> I just wanted to mention, um, I'm sure others of you heard this on your drive into work on NPR this morning, that the um, life expectancy for Americans is dropping due to addiction. And so for the last two years, uh, the trend is moving down uh, when it had for years been moving up. So yeah, just to speak to the breadth of the problem. First time since World War I that it's going down. Going down. Yeah. Anything else? Go ahead. I'll just add that disability services can help people that are struggling with addiction as well. Yes. So that is something that is covered. So mm -hmm. it's all send them our way. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Thanks for bringing that up because, yeah, I mean, it's great. Yeah. Marty? Yeah, I just wanted to say that these, these are two of the most just impactful presentations I think we've had. I've been to almost every one. They've always been fantastic, but thank you both so much mm -hmm. for sharing personal yes. stuff that is just, um, everyone can relate to these things. Everyone can. You know, if, if you had asked people to put their hand up if they knew somebody with addiction, of it would have seen that every percent of hands up. Everybody yeah. is touched by this. <coughs> and, yeah. so, and the disability um, conversations and stories, Britt, I really want to talk with you about those sometimes too, because I've got some good stories too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, how do you think our campus is doing in communicating to students that if they do struggle with addiction or just want to talk about concerns they have about a friend or whatever? Mm -hmm. I mean, I never say anything about it in my classes that mm -hmm. I teach. 
And so I wonder how do students discover that Front Range is a welcoming place where they can maybe get some help that they haven't been able to get previously? Well, um, you know, I think our, our services are somewhat new, right, Kathleen, about the, for students to have a full-time counselor on campus, correct? I wouldn't say that that's new, but it, there's just been changes in staffing over time that I think has made marketing a little bit challenging. Right. But we, now we have one full-time person and right. one half-time person. Patty's around here. We've had five yeah. good years of a full-time full -time person. So, counselor. right. So okay. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like staff is really good about saying, you know, we have these services, not saying go get substance abuse treat treatment in any way. No. We're just right. offering that we have services. And, and then you guys talk. can give them references to yeah. go further. I do. Often that's one of the areas that if there's treatment beyond a few sessions, it's got to be sent out. We, it's not something we handle on our campus right. other than a little so. triage and a couple of sessions or two. Right. Brandon, right. again, Sorry. okay, so the question is, what are resources for uh, maybe the students with addiction and maybe talk about some of the mental health training that you guys are going to be doing? Yeah, sure. We actually have a mental health training right after this. Um, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully there's a registered as we're going to CP 107. Um, but as far as like resources specifically for addiction, um, it, there's there's a couple of different avenues. One is like if it's a student that's had like has um, access to like veteran benefits, there are some uh, we work closely with. Um, I'm spacing on the name of it right now, but Kristen Mandrick has it has it. Um, but they have um, specific resources. Besides that, we um, our counselors, which I think you just spoke about, and then we have a lot of our community um, access. So. Um, I know, like, we'll reach out to, like, CSU or United Way, like, whatever um, uh, resources that they have as far as addic addiction treatment and things like that. And then, I don't know, does disabilities do any reach out for addiction? Yeah, so if the student has any academic-related impacts um, related to their addiction and, and things that are spilling over to the academic side, we'll, we'll work with the student and, and okay. figure out how to support them. I think, you know, there's always more that we can do, and this is absolutely a conversation that shouldn't end here. Um, but we are, as a community, working on it. Um, and of course, there's always room to grow. One more question, and then we'll wrap up. Um, I guess it's more of a statement, but I would say the more relationships students have with faculty and staff, on campus, the more likely they are to disclose and to um, seek um, assistance. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's when a student doesn't feel connected or doesn't feel a relationship with someone on campus that they don't disclose. That's it. So that's a community. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to close just thanking both of them for sharing what matters to them. How about another round of applause? Everybody, we make every, we want to make everybody feel welcome and that they know that they matter here to us and this is just evidence of that. So thank you all for coming. And the next one is going to be on January 23rd. So please uh, share this with your with, um, folks on campus, with students, ask them to come. But uh, January 23rd is our next What Matters to Me. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.